A couple hours went by. The dead man's name was Frank, and he was buried outside in the cold Alaskan ground. Two of the men were unharmed, physically at least. The third was alive, but only barely. His body was covered in bloody slashes, and one of his eyes had been gouged out. I managed to stabilize him, but only just. The other two men vaguely explained what happened. Apparently, Subject One leaped out at Frank after the door had opened. Only, it wasn't really Subject One anymore. According to them, it had a hideously contorted face and long, sharp claws. They claimed to have shot it over a dozen times before it fell dead, and then they emptied another dozen bullets into it, just to be sure it was really down. Only once it was dead did they come back. After tending to the wounded man, I went to investigate the monitors, as afraid as I was of seeing what those monitors may hold. I needed to see. Subject 3 was the only one left now, and I needed to see it and make sure the creature was still in his room. It seemed to be more like a jail cell than any ordinary room at this point though, which was probably a good thing. The cameras displaying Subject One's room and the hallway outside of it displayed a static-filled screen. No one was sent to repair them or investigate. We just had to hope that Subject One was well and truly dead. Monitor 3's image was exactly the same as I had left it. Subject 3 who was still staring directly into the camera at us. He was still in the exact same position, and if it were not for the small fan in the corner of the room, I would have thought I was looking at a still image. In a way, I felt relief at seeing this. Relief that he was still in his room and had not escaped while no one was looking. After everything quieted down, I noticed something especially unusual. There was a strange sound emanating from somewhere. At first, it was barely noticeable. The only reason I heard it was because of how extremely quiet it was in the infirmary. But as time went by, it slowly began to increase in volume. After about an hour, it was loud enough that everyone else could hear it too. After a couple more hours, its volume had increased so much we could determine what the noise was. It was a song. One of the staff members identified it as Living in the Sunlight by Tiny Tim. Apparently his father loved the song and listened to it frequently. The song seemed to be on a loop and kept replaying itself. Although we were able to identify the noise, we remained unable to find its source. We knew that it wasn't coming from the speakers because we had turned them off. It seemed to be emitting from the walls themselves. More time ticked by as we all began to become increasingly agitated by the song. I spent most of my time in the infirmary attending to Frank or in the control room. Fear hung in the air and the presence of unmistakable darkness and evil was no doubt its source. Subject 3 still had not moved. He had kept his unblinking gaze fixed on the camera the entire time. 
It always felt like he was staring directly at me, no matter where I was in the room. I think this effect was also felt by others due to the fact that they seemed to be moving around the room a lot and for seemingly no reason. After a few hours, the song was so loud that people almost had to shout in order to communicate. We had been trying to find its source so that we could turn the damn thing off, but it was to no avail. The source was completely unidentifiable. This added a level of extreme irritation to our already very present fear. It was around 8.30 that night that the ground itself began to shake once again, just as it had done the previous night. Panic began to spread among my fellow employees and I as the shaking grew in intensity. During this, I had the sudden instinctual feeling to look over at Subject 3's monitor. It was gone. Almost as if on cue, the power went out, and thankfully, the song did as well. Ever since the security team came back, panic had been slowly building among the staff, and Zimmerman was powerless to stop it. When those lights went out, the calm projections that everyone had been trying to maintain left us, and the fear in our hearts took over. The emergency backup lights kicked on shortly after the power went out, which I gave a silent, thankful prayer for. The lights were dim, but they still allowed me to see a lot. Total panic seized us as many of my fellow staff members began screaming and rushing to the ladder in an attempt to escape. But too many were trying to use it at once, and no one was able to get very far on the ladder without someone else pulling them to the floor and taking their place. Zimmerman was shouting for everyone to calm down, but his dominating and intimidating personality had no effect here, and his demands fell upon deaf ears. It was total chaos. It wasn't long until people actually started hurting each other in their desperate attempts to get up that ladder and out of this place. I could only stand against the wall and wait for my opportunity to escape up the ladder. All the screams were soon silenced as the familiar hum of that unsettling song began to rise in volume again, only much quicker this time. And this time, it was clear that the noise was coming directly from the maze-like corridors. People stopped fighting and shouting as all of our attention shifted to the door that led into the hallways. The song quickly got louder than it ever was before, which forced many of us to cup our ears with our hands in an attempt to silence the noise. Then, suddenly, the song just completely stopped. Silence. That was all that filled the room as we all stared at the thick metal door in anticipation for what was coming. It felt like ages had gone by, but in reality, it was probably only seconds before the silence was broken. The door suddenly, violently burst open and the music started again, louder than it had ever been before. The suddenness and the volume of this caused many of us to recoil by falling to the ground and grabbing our ears in an attempt to cover the noise. I glanced up for just a second, and in the doorway stood a tall, smooth-skinned figure with long limbs and eyes so dark and malevolent that you could clearly see them in the dim lighting. After I got my bearings, I looked upwards at the creature once again, just in time to see the thing pick up and rip Zimmerman in half with one fluid movement, dousing 
the room and everyone in it with his blood, intestines, and organs. I was no stranger to gore, but the sight of that was too much for me to bear. I hunched over immediately after seeing this and vomited all over the cold cement floor. That ladder is my only hope of survival, I thought to myself as I forced myself to a standing position and as my eyes rose along with the rest of me, I could see the thing ripping and tearing through the people as they scattered in an attempt to escape it. It was distracted, and as awful as it sounds, this was my only chance to get up that ladder. I forced my legs to move towards the ladder, trying to block out the terrified screams of my fellow staff members and the unbearably loud music. I could hear gunshots coinciding with the screams and terrible sounds of flesh being ripped apart somewhere in the mess of the noise. I reached my hands outwards and felt a wave of relief wash over me as my fingers came into contact with the hard metal rungs of the ladder. I gripped them and began to climb upwards as quickly as I could in my disorientated state, all the while praying that the monster would not see me and pull me off the ladder and back into the slaughter. It felt like at any moment I would feel one of its smooth hands wrap around my ankles and pull me to my death, but I eventually made it to the top. There was no question in my mind. I had to close the hatch and seal that damn thing down there, even if it meant certain death for my colleagues. I could not allow that thing to escape. I gripped the thick metal lid and began to push it with all my might in an attempt to seal the underground complex off. Despite how dense and sturdy it was, the lid was surprisingly easy to move and did not take very much effort to push it over the hatch, even in my weakened state. In seconds, the hatch was completely covered by the dense metal lid. I collapsed on my side and began to vomit some more as exhaustion overtook me. And as I lay there, I realized something aside from my labored breaths. The only thing I could hear was the faint echo of that song from down below. I felt as though I would lose more of my sanity if I continued to lay there and listen to that song, so I once again forced myself to my feet and began to make my way to the wooden lodge I had stayed in the previous night. It was where I had left my baggage, and also where I had left the keys to my truck. Of the 15 staff members that took part in that forsaken experiment, I am the only one who survived. I have never returned to the awful place where all of this happened, and I don't intend to do so. The project was very secretive, and Zimmerman was the only one who knew all of the details. and. As far as I know, no one is aware of my involvement aside from me. In fact, I am probably the only one who knows what the Harbinger experiment truly was, let alone what actually happened. By now, you are probably wondering why I have told you all about something none of you should be aware of. Maybe you're expecting me to give you a speech about not messing with things you don't understand or something along those lines. Oh, I hope not, for I have no speech to give or lesson to impart. I began hearing a noise earlier today. Almost immediately, I recognized the noise as a very haunting and familiar song. I didn't even try to trace its source. I knew it would be pointless. And as the day progressed, the song has increased in volume. It's loud enough now that I can very clearly make out the lyrics. 
I am completely unable to escape Tiny Tim's voice. It has followed me everywhere I have gone. Subject 3 is coming for me. And I know my time left in this world is extremely limited now. I guess you could say that I just wanted to tell the tale of the Harbinger experiment before it was lost forever. I hope you will take some lesson from what I have recounted to you, but I think we both know you won't. Let's be honest, you don't believe a word of what I have just told you, and I don't blame you. I wouldn't believe me if I were you. To you, this is nothing more than something to get your cheap thrills from. You were probably mindlessly surfing the internet when you clicked a link and found yourself here, wherever here may be, listening to this story. And to be honest, I don't care if you believe me or not. Even if you do, it probably won't stop you from trying to uncover the truth of a darkness that few of us have ever seen. It certainly never stopped Zimmerman. If you want a lesson, look at what happened to him when he went seeking the truth. I pray that none of you will ever discover this truth. I pray that none of you will ever have to see the evil I have seen. I hope you all get to live in ignorance of what lies beyond the veil of what we can understand. It's here now. I can feel its black eyes burning into me as I could all those years ago. I am as much to blame as Zimmerman is for the monstrosity that is now free to roam the world. Even if I was not the one to create it. To you, I'm sorry. Please, forgive me. <laughs>